Hello, adventurers. Nope, that's what Cody says. F is alignment important in your D&D game? Let's find out. D&D, fifth edition. How do they handle alignment? Let's explore that. So here's a fifth edition player's handbook. I'm gonna to go to the table of contents. And where I would think that I would find alignment should be somewhere in like the whole beginning character creation thing, right? But in fact, it's not even in the table of contents. I'm gonna just show you. It's not even in the table of contents. Where the hell is alignment in fifth edition? Go to the back here. And I go to the index, the fine print, like four point font print. Alphabetically search for alignment. And lo and behold, I find alignment. And this is how it's listed, friends. Alignment, 122. That's one page, not a range of pages, just one page. So we go to 122, which I have bookmarked with a napkin from Portillo's. No, maybe McDonald's, I don't know. Here's what fifth edition alignment says. A typical creature in the worlds of Dungeons and Dragons has an alignment which broadly describes its moral and personal attitudes. Alignment is a combination of two factors. One identifies morality, good, evil, or neutral. Neutral? Really, Bill? Good, evil, or neutral. And the other describes attitudes toward society and order, lawful, chaotic, or neutral. Thus, nine distinct alignments define the possible combinations. These brief summaries of the nine alignments describe the typical behavior of a creature with that alignment. Individuals might vary significantly from that typical behavior, and few people are perfectly and consistently faithful to the precepts of their alignment. Some of you who watch D&D with high school students might be saying to yourself, Bill, I've noticed that you don't pay a lot of attention to alignment and that you don't explore it a lot with the newbie players and that you don't make it a big factor of their role playing. And that's true because I haven't used it. Haven't. I also, when I've been playing characters recently, which isn't much because I'm usually a DM, but when I have played in shows like The Bard's Tale or um, other, you know, gatherings that uh, are held for gaming, I, um, I also don't use alignment. The reason why I've been a bit opposed to alignment is because I feel like in a lot of people's game settings, alignment can be too restrictive. Um, whether it's the player interpreting it too strictly um, or the DM requiring players to play within their alignment too strictly. I'm not saying I don't value the concept of alignment, but I think the wording here is really important. Let me read, read this component, right? These brief summaries of the nine alignments describe the typical behavior. I want to focus on typical. Like, Wizards of the Coast should have put that in bold. Typical. It doesn't mean concrete. It doesn't mean you always, if you're lawful good, you can never deviate from this code. Okay. Individuals might vary significantly from that typical behavior. So I like the fact that Wizards post, like, they, they followed up by emphasizing this. But do you as players and you as game masters and DMs, do you actually understand that? Do you understand what they're trying to, to say here? Have you inferred the correct meaning? And my assertion is that the correct meaning for alignment is in fact a code or a moral compass or a set of guidelines for your character to generally follow, but no person is ever uniformly on their path in life. And I mean this not just in games, I mean this in reality, right? You could be an inherently good person who believes in law and order and the importance of a civilized country who sometimes breaks the rules. I do, I'm sure many of you do. How many of you have ever done a rolling stop at a stop sign when there's no other cars around? Or how many of you have gone 10 over the speed limit on the road? Or maybe when you were a kid, you shoplifted like a piece of candy. You know what I mean? We might be good people who sometimes do things that aren't good or sometimes do things that aren't lawful, right? So I think the important thing here is that in 5th edition D&D, 
Wizards of the Coast recognize that alignment is valuable to guide you in terms of role playing your character, but isn't a mechanic that they want to spend too much time on or make it too much of a focus of how the game works. And they go on to describe the alignments, right? But it's literally just one page in the player's handbook. Now you might be wondering, well, Bill, I'm sure that they kept it short and sweet for the player's handbook, but in the Dungeon Master's Guide, they probably vastly explored it. Guess what? I open up the table of contents while I'm researching this. There's nothing about alignment. I go to the index at the back of the book, which is not insignificant for the Dungeon Master's Guide, and I look up alignment, and guess what I don't find? There's nothing. There's literally nothing in the Dungeon Master's Guide about alignment. So what can we infer from that? We can infer that in 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, alignment is a role-playing element, but not an important game mechanic. And that's a big thing to consider. Why is that a big thing to consider? Because I'm going to take us back in the time machine. That's right, people. My first edition AD&D books. I'm going to compare now and more importantly contrast the difference between alignment in 5th edition now and how it was originally conceived in 1st edition. And we can maybe, maybe get some more meaning out of this. So let's start with the player's handbook. How does alignment differ between 1st and 5th edition? So uh, you might notice, by the way, that my player's handbook is pink. The reason for that is, quite simply, I brought it on a road trip, a family road trip to Florida, and it sat in the back of the car, and the sun was so intense that it bleached my player's handbook. So, um, This player's handbook, in the table of contents, where you would think that alignment would be, it's not just some small sub-note, but after races and classes, it's a big, bold thing. Am I pointing to the right thing? It's kind of hard to read upside down. Alignment. Big, bold thing. So, right off the bat, that shows that in first edition, alignment was considered kind of an important mechanic. Let me expand on, um, on TSR's uh, offerings here. So this is, if you have an old school player's handbook, this is on page 33. Alignment. After generating the abilities of your character, selecting his or her race, and deciding upon a class, it is necessary to determine the alignment of the character. Look at how, how important alignment is. I mean, they're, they're basically saying that, like, look, you pick out your race class abilities, but then alignment, boom. Like, th this is more important than hit points. This is more important than AC, than equipment. They put it in a, a forefront. They put it in an important place in the character creation process. Let's see why. It is possible that the selection of the class your character will profess has predetermined your alignment. A druid is neutral. A paladin is lawful good. A thief can be neutral or evil. An assassin is always evil. That's interesting. Um, yet, except for druids and paladins, such restrictions still leave latitude. The thief can be lawful neutral, lawful evil, neutral evil, chaotic evil, chaotic neutral, neutral, or even neutral good. And the assassin has nearly as many choices. The alignments possible for characters are described below. Then, um, much like 5th edition, they have brief descriptions of the alignments. Um, the descriptions are not exactly the same. They've evolved. But essentially, there are you know, nine alignment ranges. Now, this is the part that I'd like to compare and compra uh, contrast with the 5th edition. So this is an interesting little paragraph. Naturally, there are all variations and shades of tendencies within each alignment. The descriptions are generalizations only. What can we infer just from that? Just from that statement. I think that we can read that statement and see a very similar description in 5th edition that says, look, these are block guidelines for your character's moral compass, their behavior, their belief system, but there are tendencies. There are variations. They meant it, even in first edition, they meant alignment to have some flexibility. It wasn't meant to be this inflexible you know, code um, that your character had to always play by. 
the descriptions are generalizations only. And then it goes on. A character could be basically good in its true neutrality or tend towards evil. It is probable that your campaign referee will keep a graph of the drift of your character on the alignment chart. Now that's, I'm laughing because like keeping a graph of someone's ups and downs on an alignment chart is very much a crunchy, like old school mechanic thing. Like people, like I, I would never keep a graph of that. That's ridiculous. Um, this is affected by the actions and desires of your character during the course of each adventure and will be reflected on the graph. You may find that these actions are such as to cause the declared alignment to be shifted towards or actually to some other. So maybe there's a mechanical reason to keep the graph because they're saying that if you played out of character or out of alignment enough that you can actually shift alignment. Now that's an interesting concept. There's no discussion about that in fifth edition. If you make it a paladin who's lawful good and you consistently weren't role-playing that character lawful good, what is the DM supposed to do? Just accept it? Or just ignore alignment altogether because they realize that it's too, too messy? Or do they say, hey, you haven't been role-playing lawful good, you've been really role-playing more like chaotic good. And based on these adventures and what I've been keeping, and this graph that I've been keeping, um, you are now chaotic good. So what's that do? What's the point? So in first edition, there's actually a block paragraph called changing alignment. Hmm. I know that you can't smell things on video, but for those of you watching right now, I just want to tell you this book has seen some time. It's an old book. It smells old. It smells like when you're in a library and you find an old book and you're like, it has mythos. You know what I'm saying? I, I haven't, this is fun. This is a fun video for me, you guys. Just as like a meta moment, this is a fun video for me to do because I have not busted out these books for any actual practical reason other than dusting them off in the shelf in a long time. So it's kind of fun to go back to this. All right, and maybe it's no coincidence because this year marks the 40th anniversary of my playing D&D and role-playing games. So back to changing alignment. While involuntary change of alignment is quite possible, it is very difficult for a character to voluntarily switch from one to another, except within limited areas. Evil alignment can be varied along the like axis. The neutral character can opt for some more specific alignment. Your referee will, care, will probably require certain stringent sacrifices and appropriate acts, possibly a quest as well, for any other voluntary alignment change. In fact, even axial change within evil or good or radial movement from neutrality may require strong proof of various acts. Further voluntary change will be even more difficult. Changing back to a forsaken alignment is next to impossible on a voluntary basis. Even involuntary drift will bring the necessity of great penance. So the fact that there's even a, like a paragraph block about changing alignment is pretty significant. They thought about it. They must have play tested. They must have had experiences in their adventures, in their campaigns, where people shifted from good to evil or lawful to chaotic or, or some other form of, of changing alignment. That's a recognition. This is my inference now. That is a recognition, in my opinion, that they, they understood that alliant, it wasn't realistic for a player to, to have to consistently play an alignment for a character without any deviation. And that furthermore, in some storylines, it might be more interesting to see that. And I, I know, I think we could all think of some stories from books or movies where somebody had a fundamental life experience that changed their alignment, changed who they are. You know, a good person who was really put through something traumatic and then just became whatever, became evil, or somebody who was fundamentally lawful and law-abiding who, you know, went through some, you know, epic life-changing experience that exposed them to, you know, a different kind of perspective, and now they're, they're kind of more chaotic or entropic or whatever, what, what have you. I think there are plenty of heroes and villains who go through these alignment shifts, right? So I think it's just cool to see what, you know, 
the originators kind of envisioned with uh, first edition AD&D regarding alignment. But this video is not done. I briefly mentioned mechanics. O alignment. Now, here's where I start to get a little bit mm, salty, let's say. Because, yes, in a way, they understood that alignment from a role plane perspective needed to be flexible. But then they went and made a whole bunch of mechanics because remember that, you know, D&D was derived from and created by wargamers. They were naturally people who liked lots of rules and crunchy, number crunching stuff, right? Mechanics. So they created a lot of mechanics about alignment as it impacted magic and equipment, specifically magical or enchanted items. And this is where I start to get annoyed, because I remember being a player and being like, well, why can't I use that sword? Because you're good and the sword is evil. I, who cares? It's a sword, you know? Now, if that was an element of role playing, if the DMs at the time had said, okay, go ahead and pick it up, see what happens. And then I become gradually like my mind is poisoned by the suggestions of the evil sword, you know, or my soul is tainted somehow. That would have been a cool role playing experience, but those things didn't happen. A lot of times, the way I saw alignment being implemented or used in games with regards to equipment and spells was just kind of like a, you know, putting up a wall. And that, even as a kid, I recognized that wasn't cool. Okay, so, <clears throat> bum, bum, bum. let's get into the mix. The DM's Guide has a whole bunch of stuff about alignment. Alignment describes the broad ethos of thinking, reasoning creatures. Pretty cool. Again, even then in first edition, they're saying the broad ethos. Those unintelligent sorts being placed within the neutral area because they are totally uncaring. I don't know about that. Um, note that alignment does not necessarily dictate religious persuasion, although many religious beliefs will dictate alignment. As explained under alignment languages, this aspect of alignment is not the major consideration. To overall, sorry, the overall behavior of the characters, behavior determines actual alignment. Wow, let me reread that. This is, we're experiencing some revelations right now, people. Um, the overall behavior of the character is delineated by alignment, or in the case of player characters, behavior determines actual alignment. That's pretty deep because that's them recognizing that a player could choose an alignment but that their overall behavior can vary from that and then that behavior and actual role playing should determine their true alignment. Let's, let's continue. Therefore, besides defining the general tendencies of creatures, it is also groups, cre it also groups creatures into mutually acceptable or at least non-hostile divisions. This is not to say that groups or similarly aligned creatures cannot be opposed or even mortal enemies. Two nations, for example, with rulers of lawful good alignment can be at war. Bands of orcs can hate each other, but the former would possibly cease their war to oppose a massive invasion of orcs, just as the latter would make common cause against the lawful good men. Thus, alignment describes the worldview of creatures and helps to define what their actions, reactions, and purposes will be. It likewise causes a player character to choose an ethos which is appropriate to his or her profession, and alignment also aids players in the definition and role approach of their respective game persona. With the usefulness of alignment determined, definition of the divisions is necessary. Written like a true tech manual. Um, that was very dry, but yet informative, okay? Very logical. Major divisions. There are two major divisions of four opposite points of view. All four are not mutually exclusive, although each pair is mutually opposed. Law and chaos. The opposition here is between organized groups and individuals. That is, law dictates that order and organization is necessary and desirable, while chaos holds to the opposite view. Law generally supports the group as more important than the individual, while chaos promotes the individual over the group. Good and evil. Basically stated, the tenets of good and human rights, or in the case of AD&D, creature rights. Each creature is entitled to life, relative freedom, and the prospect of happiness. Cruelty and suffering are undesirable. 
Evil, on the other hand, does not concern itself with rights or happiness. Purpose is the determinant. There can never exist a lawful chaos or an evil good. Um, these and their reverses are dichotomous. Man. So then they go ahead and they describe, in the same way that the Player's Handbook did in all the editions, they describe the, the nine basic options, right? Neutrality, neutral good, neutral evil, lawful good, lawful neutral, lawful evil, chaotic good, chaotic neutral, chaotic evil. Each of these cases for alignment is, of course, stated rather simplistically and ideally for philosophical and moral reasonings are completely subjective according to the accumulation of the individual. Now remember this is the DM's guide, so this next passage is important. You, as dungeon master, must establish the meanings and boundaries of law and order as opposed to chaos and anarchy, as well as the divisions between right and good as opposed to hurtful and evil. You as the DM, you as the dungeon master. So see, here they're putting it on the dungeon master. So players have an obligation, if they're using alignment, players have an obligation to use that as a guideline for how to role play their character, their moral approach, their, their beliefs, their perspectives. But the dungeon master also has an obligation, if you're using alignment, to propagate that in the world, to populate the world, whether it's individual creatures, groups, um, organizations, whole kingdoms, whatever, right? So they go on to say, lawful societies will tend to be highly structured, rigid, well-policed, and bureaucratic hierarchical. Class, rank, position, and precedence will be important, so they'll be strictly defined and adhered to. On the other hand, chaotic areas will have little, little government and few social distinctions. Um, they go on here, Alignment continues on for another two pages. They talk about alignment with respect to the planes. They talk about graphing alignment. So the reference they made about the graph. <laughs> See Player's Handbook, Appendix 3, Character Alignment Graph. Okay, let me bop back to that. <clears throat> this should be funny. Uh, appendix three, there it is. There's the graph. So you don't have to make your own. You just photocopy this back in the old days. And then the DM could just kind of um, put you, you know, where you should be and then make little notes of your behaviors on this graph. And maybe each character would have one of these graphs and the DM would secretly keep track of it behind their DM screen. Now, that might be your jam. You might be like, holy crap, first edition had it going on. They, they know what's up. That's what I'm going to do. Then do it. That's cool. Remember, my general philosophy is like, just because I've been doing this for a long time doesn't mean I'm always right. And everybody can run what they want however they want. That's how they wrote it. I mean, here's proof, man. So use this or don't use it. I mean, it's cool that they came up with it. But obviously, fifth edition took a step away from the importance of alignment, because here, there's even more. Alignment language. What? This is craziness. Let's read this. Alignment language is a handy game tool which is not unjustifiable in real terms. Thieves did employ a special cant. Secret organizations and societies did and do have certain recognition signs, signals, and recognition phrases, possibly special languages of limited extent. Consider also the medieval Catholic Church, which used Latin as a common recognition and communication base to cut across national boundaries. In AD&D, alignment languages are the special set of signs, signals, gestures, and words which intelligent creatures use to inform other intelligent creatures of the same alignment of their fellowship and common ethos. Alignment languages are never flaunted in public. It goes on to describe how alignment language works credentials, um, not using it in public, how it's constructed. So I vaguely remember sometime in the early to mid 80s playing with alignment languages. But I don't think that at that age, even with older brothers DMing for us, I don't think we implemented that. So it's, I'd be curious if there's any of you old grognards out there who 
you know, started gaming, uh, started playing D&D in the 70s or early 80s when you were in college, maybe you were able to implement alignment languages in a more useful way. I could see the value if role played well, but my own spin on it, how I would do it differently, is instead of just being like, oh, I speak lawful good, I would actually have some, like a religious, you know, maybe there's a religion that uses this old dead language that nobody uses anymore, kind of like Latin, you know, or uh, like Aramaic, you know what I mean? Like some dead language that's ancient, but they still, like, you know, this religion that follows this specific alignment code they use this language. I would make it more organic to the game because I think it's just stupid being like, I speak chaotic evil. That just sounds stupid, doesn't it? I mean, all right. Then they have a whole section on changing alignment, which again, must have been a big deal because they're recognizing that that would happen. So um, kind of an interesting thing. Let's, let's contrast for a moment. Your first edition books definitely spend more time discussing and exploring and explaining alignment, without a doubt. Like it's just on the real, on the real estate, on the paper. There's literally more like word count in first edition than in fifth. That's one major contrast, right? Um, the other major contrast would be like mechanically, fifth edition doesn't really have a lot of mechanics. The spells don't affect alignment as much anymore. Um, the equipment isn't as uh, encumbered by mechanics for alignment, whereas this stuff definitely was. I mean, just basic spells. Like, there used to be, like, detect alignment, or, you know, now the detect spells are a little more broad in their interpretation. There used to be, like, protection from evil, protection from good, you know, whereas now it's just kind of more protection. So it's a little more broad. So this definitely had more of a focus on alignment, more mechanics related to alignment, and more guidance about how to integrate alignment into the game. In other words, in the early days, they considered alignment really important, and they wanted you to use it. They wanted you to use it in the game, and they felt like it was valuable enough to, to explore. And over time, and different companies and authors and community feedback, Alignment's not as important here. So where does that leave us? I don't use alignment a lot because typically what I do is I have a character concept and now with fifth edition, when you make your character, you have things like your ideals, your bond, your, your flaws, all those kind of things that help further define in incorporating your background, your class, your race, that help further define your character. Do I have a problem with people using alignment? Absolutely not, no. But do I feel a need to incorporate it? No. I think the actions of the players as they're playing their characters sort of determine that, don't they? And if you think about um, our show, D&D with High School Students, frequently uh, the actions of the characters, especially in second season, are described as murder hobos. and and. I would say without a doubt, they perpetrated many evil actions. Yeah, they did, without a doubt. I, people could easily make an argument that they are chaotic evil, but I don't think that their overall tendencies are evil. Chaotic, yes. They absolutely had no regard for the law. Um, so on the lawful to chaotic spectrum, they're definitely chaotic. I would think that maybe they're more chaotic neutral. They're selfish, which, you know, they're high school students, so what do you expect? All right, well, I hope you've had a fun time um, listening to uh, this rant, this discussion, this exploration about alignment. Um, use it, don't use it, it's up to you. Uh, but you know what? Leave some comments below. Let me know how you use alignment, if you use it. If you're an old school gamer who used it back in the day with first edition, how much of an impact did alignment have on you? And again, thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. Make sure you click that little bell icon to get those notifications so that when we have new videos coming out, uh, YouTube will let you know. And uh, we'll see you on the next video. What's that, Wizzy? Everybody should subscribe? Good idea. 
Wizzy thinks that you guys should subscribe and make sure you click on that little bell icon to get those notifications and check out some of the other videos and playlists that we have on the channel. There's all sorts of good gaming stuff for you and your family. Maybe not your family, but 